Respected Your Holiness, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I would like to request uh, Geshe Doji Damdil, the director of Tibet House, to come and give the welcome remarks to His Holiness. <clears throat> With due respect to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, all the guests and the, the public, it is great honor for Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Trisha the Meditation Center in Delhi to welcome you all to this teaching of His Holiness the Dalai Lama on the three principal paths here in Bodhijandi Park. While a number of teachings are happening in Delhi, this I think is one of the few teachings of His Holiness for the public. Looking at each of the visions of Your Holiness, they are all so precious for the goodness and joy of sentient beings and humanity in particular. Yet I fear only few are wise enough to see them as rare gifts of treasure from your holiness for the entire world. I take this opportunity to spell out some of them to remind each one of us here in this gathering of the living examples of Bodhisattva's compassionate noble deeds demonstrated by your holiness, wherefrom we the seekers can seek and learn to, to the best we can in our day-to-day -day life. This is the true meaning of students learning from their teachers. The qualities of your holiness are summarized in three forms, unconditional compassion, care for knowledge, and skillfulness. These qualities of your holiness make the whole world with great love and affection turn towards you for guidance, your holiness, sees that only through the combination of human values which are grounded on warmth and compassion and the wisdom of objective awareness of the reality in its holistic form can we expect to see a genuine happiness and peace occurring in the individuals and on this planet, otherwise not. There too you see the urgent need to inculcate these two values in the education system so that we start learning the set values since our childhood. We strongly advocate the need for it to be inclusive of all sections of the humanity, such as non-believers. This you coined as secular ethics. Forgetting the non-believers, which constitute the majority of the human population, genuine world peace and happiness cannot be feasible. You also displayed such a courageous gesture of compassion and forgiveness. You stand to sign up as the first signatory to abolish capital punishment. From this gesture of yours, we, your students and admirers, learn in action what it means by unconditional love and forgiveness. You pioneered the promotion of mass vegetarianism within the Tibetan community, including the official gatherings and the monastic institutions. Your Holiness profusely stand to reduce the gap between rich and poor. Your Holiness advocates the need for the more affluent sections to provide skills and technology to the weaker section to help upgrade the poorest section's living standard. From this again, we learn the Bodhisattva's quality of not only compassion, but skillful means as well. Your Holiness strongly advocates disarmament within and eventually without. You encourage the mass education so much, particularly the education of the women. It is through your effort that nowadays we find a number of nunneries which are able to provide the same standard of philosophical studies and so forth as the monks in the monasteries. You also introduce modern science in the Tibetan monastic institutions, which is such a breakthrough vision and effort which helps to seamlessly join the ancient wisdom and the modern education. Foreseeing the tremendous potential in all the major religious traditions, increasingly Your Holiness strives to bring harmony among the major religious systems of the world. One of the major contributions Your Holiness has so prominently made is to, the legacy of, is to let the legacy of Nalinda University, the legacy of wisdom and compassion, shine forth once more in the world and in India in particular, which was once the origin of this rich treasure. 
every effort listed above of your visions and practical efforts made for the larger good of the future world makes, the pen makes a sensible and wise person lost in admiration, hope, and reverence to you. It is for this reason that today the whole world turns towards you for guidance. This is the legacy of yours, your holiness. This is the biography of yours. You are truly the sun to dispel the darkness of the world today. You are the beacon of hope for the whole world today. For the millions find joy even by hearing your name, let alone the effects they feel through seeing you and actually receiving guidance and teachings from you. Finally, the whole world prays that your holiness lives long to continuously guide and lead the world from darkness to the light. Please live long, your holiness, for all sentient beings. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I now request His Holiness to teach? Today we are gathered here for the teaching on, on the three principal aspects of the path. Um, quite some time ago, this Buddha Jayanti Park was um, made in memory um, of uh, the Buddha. Um, and uh, the uh, Buddha statue in the Tibetan style was um, installed in this park in order to, uh, in remembrance and commemoration of the Buddhas and uh, our uh, gratitude to the uh, Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. And uh, there have been a uh, number of uh, Dharma discourses that have happened here in India, in Delhi. And today we are also gathered here, um, uh, organized uh, by Tushita Meditation Center and Tibet House in New Delhi. And I'm very uh, honored to uh, be here, and I thank you for inviting me. <coughs> so on page number two, you read uh, this verse from Master Nagarjuna's um, treatise on, on the, the fundamental treatise of the Middle Way. On, where it says, and to use by great compassion, you expounded the sublime truth in order to eliminate all views to you, the Gautama Buddha, I pay homage. So uh, this uh, verse comes from the 27th chapter of Master Nagarjuna's text. At the end of that uh, uh, book, Master Nagarjuna uh, pays his homage um, in gratitude of the Buddha uh, for his teaching, dependent origination, and the um, the fundamental treatise of the Middle Way is an explanation of the essence of the Buddha's teaching, which is the perfection of wisdom sutras. And so the meaning of this uh, particular verse is um, uh, uh, that uh, the Buddha showed us the path to free ourselves uh, from suffering. Um, out of his compassion to us, he gave uh, his holy teaching. And um, the suffering that we undergo uh, happens because of the condition, because of conditions. And uh, ultimately, uh, the condition or the cause of suffering is ignorance. And um, because of ignorance, it's very clear to us that uh, we suffer because we all don't want suffering, but uh, we want happiness. Although that is our way and, uh, what we want, happiness is what we want and suffering is what we don't want. We uh, are constantly suffer and have all kinds of problems in our life. Uh, these over seven billion people on this earth, nobody wants any suffering but happiness. But why do suffering happen to us is because of our ignorance. And so this is very clear to us that ignorance is the cause of suffering. And uh, in Buddhism, well, what we uh, say is that pain and pleasure come from uh, causes and conditions, dear causes and conditions, and uh, suffering uh, ultimately comes from ignorance. And within ignorance, uh, there is a mere uh, not knowing about things, and then another type of ignorance, which is the distorted kind of um, view, distorted ignorance, um, misconceptions about reality, uh, reality in, t in the sense of how things come about through causes and conditions, and also um, the ultimate reality of how things ex exist um, as um, the, the ultimate reality 
reality, the suchness as it's called, and therefore uh, to e eliminate the ignorance that is within us, the ignorance about the cause of causality, law of causality, and also ignorance about the dependent nature of things. The uh, Buddha has shown us the means to overcome them, and uh, they cannot go away merely by praying or wishing for them to go away or by doing some kind of prostrations and making offerings and worship, uh, worshiping the three jewels and so forth. What must happen within us is, in order to overcome ignorance, is by knowing the reality, the how things come about through causes and conditions, as well as how things are um, ultimately their nature. And therefore, uh, that's how we must, uh, what we must cultivate and develop, the wisdom realizing the nature of things in terms of how things are uh, come about through causes and conditions as well as how things are dependently originated. And therefore, to, to uh, show that, uh, Master Nagarjuna um, says, um, uh, pays this homage to the Buddha, where he says, um, infused by your great compassion, you expounded the sublime truth in order to eliminate all views. Now here, when he uses the term view, um, it should be clear to us that uh, this view is not uh, the right kind of view about causality or dependent nature of things, but all kinds of distorted views. And so this uh, uh, is quite clear from the context. And uh, therefore, uh, to generate uh, this uh, wisdom, uh, generate uh, the right view um, by, by, uh, the, uh, by generating that or by cultivating the right view, we have to overcome the ignorance. And uh, therefore, uh, dependent, uh, the, 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 the Buddhism teaches about the dependent nature of things, how things are interdependently um, uh, come about. And uh, within that, as I said earlier, there is the causality, law of causality, as well as how things are um, interrelated, interconnected. And uh, therefore, we have to develop the wisdom, knowing the karmic causality of things, as well as the uh, final reality, and overcome, through that wisdom, overcome our ignorance and thereby the suffering. And therefore, Mr. Nagarjuna pays his homage by saying to you, Gautama, I pay homage. Uh, page number 36, you see uh, this verse, um, which is uh, words of the Buddha. Um, so what this shows is how um, we go about with the Buddhist practice of Buddhism, the system, um, uh, how the Buddhist system uh, works. And uh, what this shows is the Buddha does not, uh, the Buddhas do not wash away any negativities with uh, um, water, and, and then uh, nor uh, does he clear away suffering with his hands. So Buddha cannot take away our sins or and negative actions. Um, um, with his hands, and uh, nor can he transfer his own qualities to, into us, qualities in the sense of the Buddha's realizations of how things are, and also his um, having overcome all the negativities within his own mind. And so um, overcoming all these, um, the, the qualities of having overcome all the negativities and his realization of how things are, seeing all things are uh, exactly exactly as they are. And so these um, cannot be transposed into others and to beings. And nor the Buddha himself uh, uh, became a Buddha uh, by, over, uh, by uh, through the blessings, or nearly through the blessings of uh, the past Buddhas. And, uh, but how the Buddha became enlightened is by uh, working uh, towards enlightenment by, um, uh, in such a way that he um, put effort but, um, lifetime after lifetime uh, until he reached the state of Buddhahood and uh, during which then he had, uh, during those times of working uh, to become a Buddha he worked to overcome all the defilements and uh, then also actualize the, the basic clear light or luminous nature of the mind that we also have and therefore what this shows is that the Buddha uh, didn't become was was not a Buddha, an enlightened being right from the beginning. 
He was like us, od uh, first of all, ordinary beings like us. And then um, uh, by applying the teachings that he had received um, within himself and by um, applying those teachings and overcoming the negativities as well as um, actualizing this clear light or the luminous nature of the mind that we also have, he finally became somebody who is an all-knowing one, an exalted being, Buddha. And therefore, what this shows is that we also need to put effort in um, uh, a practice, uh, practicing the teaching of the Buddha. So the way the Buddha helps us is only by teaching the path, as it says in, uh, in line four, he shows the true path. By that alone are beings liberated. And therefore, um, this, uh, by, by showing the, how things are, the nature of things, the reality of things, um, just as the Buddha himself has learned and also uh, become aware of, fully aware of, um, uh, through his own experience, he has shown us the path to and enlightenment, Buddhahood, and therefore the way to overcome suffering in Buddhism is not only through prayers and so forth, but by uh, developing and cultivating this wisdom, knowing the reality of things, and uh, therefore um, that wisdom uh, overcomes or eliminates the ignorance, which is the root of suffering. And so in this way, we also have to tread the path uh, that the Buddha has shown. So in, on page uh, 45, there is this, uh, there are two verses uh, from Mazum Nagarjuna's uh, text uh, referred to earlier. Uh, in dependent origination, there is no ceasing, no arising, no annihilation, no permanence, no coming, no going, no separateness and no sameness. I prostrate to the consummate Buddha, the supreme among all teachers, the one who taught this peace, which is freed of elaborations. And so uh, what this uh, verse basically is showing is um, what, uh, which kind of right view we should develop in order to overcome the wrong kinds of view that we have, uh, wrong views in terms of the four uh, aspects, uh, seeing unclean phenomena like our body, which is impure and clean as uh, clean, and then seeing the impermanent uh, things which are impermanent as being permanent and unchanging, and then seeing things which are in the nature of suffering as uh, having or uh, being pleasant, and then where uh, things are selfless, uh, uh, perceiving and perceiving the things to have self um, or uh, self nature or um, self. In this verse, what the uh, Master Nagarjuna actually is trying to show is that um, to us, usually what happens is that things seem to have some kind of objective existence, that they have some objective independent existence. But that appearance, we must not be satisfied with the appearance, mere appearance of things, but uh, do analysis of how things actually exist. And uh, therefore, when we do analysis into things, like the, in the na uh, analysis into the nature of things, what we see is that the, uh, when we do the final an I mean, analysis into the final nature of things, then we don't find uh, either uh, arising or ceasing. And uh, similarly, uh, when we uh, look at things from the, uh, uh, the ultimate nature of the continuity of things, then there is no permanence and no annihilation and uh, so forth. And so what this, uh, what Master Nagarjuna here is trying to show is that um, of course, he's not saying that things do not have a rising or they, they are not produced and that they do not cease and so forth. Of course, these are there. The, the uh, things do arise through causes and conditions and, uh, and uh, through dependence on other factors. And they do cease uh, uh, through uh, in, in dependence on causes and conditions. And then there is uh, also uh, things which are permanent and then also uh, the cessation of things as well as coming and going and one and many. And so these things are there, but what Master Nagarjuna is basically showing here is that when we do analysis into the real nature of things, then we do not, within that um, uh, uh, 
when we find certitude that nothing can be found through analysis, and so within that perspective, there is no coming, going, uh, rising, cessation, and so forth. And so what uh, he is not saying that things have no coming, going, and so forth. Uh, in conventional terms, which we all know they, uh, things have, things do arise, and uh, things do come and go, and so forth. But um, uh, the reason that Masa Nagarjuna uh, uses to say that things do uh, the dependent nature, uh, things which are in the nature of dependence do not have uh, cessation and so forth is because they do not have any objective existence in that sense of um, arising and so forth because they are dependently arisen. And therefore the reason, uh, the reasoning that he uses is dependence because things are uh, designated through dependence and therefore they do not have any um, independent essence or uh, objective existence of their own. And so uh, that is the ma ma main reason that he is using to prove that things have no uh, coming and going and so forth in the ultimate sense and not um, uh, saying that uh, things do not have coming and going and so forth in conventional terms. And so uh, the, this is um, what uh, Master Nagarjuna is uh, using to praise the Buddha for teaching that dependent origination, things that uh, come through dependent uh, origination uh, do not have coming and going and so forth when we do analysis into the nature of things. I think, you know, I think many are problem. Actually, I think even small sort of problem. Uh, we see, uh, uh, we you see just simply based on appearances, uh, then believe. That is the reality. So through that, that way, any action which based on just appearances, then it often become unrealistic sort of method. So we must know the reality, not based on appearances. Because it is quite clear, there is always gap appearances and reality. I think we can say the very purpose of education is try to reduce this gap appearances and reality. And particularly scientific research is actually try to, so they try to reduce this gap. Uh, do not content about uh, appearances, but further investigate what's the reality. So now then, the Buddhist way of approach also is to try to know the reality. Because if our sort of kasoda believe just uh, on the basis of appearances, it often become wrong. So in order to gain our even you see bad things, want to do something uh, harm, harmful, I mean, even you want to harm someone, you must know the reality. <laughs> Knowing the reality, uh, try to find the weak point of that one. Then hit. <laughs> That's the realistic way. <laughs> Without knowing, you see, there are weak point. Uh, you cannot hit properly. Clear? So, any action, if you want the satisfactory result, you must know the reality fully, should not rely on appearances. So, so that's the, the sins, you see, Buddha Dharma, you see, recognize the ultimate source of mistake, ultimate source of suffering, is ignorance. So the only way to remove ignorance is knowledge. Knowledge through investigation. <laughs> so, uh, that's the answer. That's the answer. 
And so um, what this, uh, these two verses of Master Nagarjuna is showing is the dependent origination of things in the sense of how things are dependent by designation, through designation. So once you understand this well, that how things are designated and dependent in terms of designation, then you will also see how things are related to each other, how things are relative as well. And so that in turn would lead you to, into the insight of how, um, uh, the deeper insight into how things are uh, causally uh, brought about, how uh, causes and conditions bring about their effects. Uh, the, uh, the law of causality would be understood better. And and therefore, um, although um, this verse seems to be, uh, this verse shows the subtle, uh, subtle uh, understanding or level of dependent origination. Uh, once you understand this subtle nature of how things are dependently originated, uh, designated uh, uh, dependently, then uh, it, it will be easier. You will be able to understand the relativity of things, the causality of things, uh, very easily. And therefore, um, uh, 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 that, that is how you would uh, uh, develop your wisdom into the law of uh, the, the causality and uh, how things are relative. And uh, therefore, uh, now in order to gain that deeper understanding into the subtle uh, dependent designation of things, um, what you would also use is the reasoning of how things are brought about through causes and conditions as well. And therefore, when you see the, that things are brought about through causes and conditions, you will be let into the insight of how they are related and relative and therefore into the subtle dependent designated nature of things and therefore you'll be able to see the, um, the compatibility between um, how things are empty uh, by nature, empty uh, of independent existence and uh, the, 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 um, the how things are dependently originated. So you'll be able to see that what is dependent origination is empty, in, uh, by, uh, empty and what is empty is also uh, dependent. So in, even in modern um, physics, um, particularly quantum physics, um, the scientists talk about how things have no objective existence. So this uh, uh, concept is very similar to the Buddhist idea of uh, or the understanding of dependently uh, related arising nature of things. And so the reason why I was um, giving this teaching, uh, explaining these things that I've done before is um, in order for you to know um, what Buddhism means, actually, to understand what Buddhism means. And, um, <coughs> Um, so many people, of course, they consider themselves, of course, many of you here might consider yourself as Buddhists, um, uh, but then um, what we can see is that you are, are more fond of, uh, or you are fond of uh, reciting mantras and um, um, other prayers. Of course, um, reciting mantras is there on, also in other traditions like Hinduism and also in uh, Islam. And then also we see uh, in the Christian practitioners also um, saying uh, the different uh, hymns and um, sort of mantras and prayers. And so uh, that, uh, and also then uh, with regard to practice of uh, the religion, um, the other people who follow these other traditions also have the practice of tolerance and not harming others and self and contentment, self-discipline and uh, so forth. And so in terms of practice and uh, recitation of mantra and prayers, uh, we, uh, all the religious traditions um, have these practices and uh, these are common to all. And uh, then um, also um, uh, when it comes to uh, religion or the spiritual practice, uh, traditions, it's not only about prayers and uh, worshipping uh, the gods and so forth. And also um, we uh, people, of course, um, uh, make their prayers to say prayers in front of statues and so forth. And so uh, this is something, these are 
are common to all different religions. But then um, we, as with this, um, what we must understand is the difference um, between the religious traditions as well. And uh, the difference lies in the philosophical understanding or philosophical view of these various religious traditions. Within the uh, uh, world religions, there are basically two uh, camps, um, those of the theistic religions and then uh, 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 that of the theistic religions, the group, and then the non-theistic religion, um, religions. And uh, within the non-theistic religions, um, there is also, uh, there are uh, differences. For example, uh, within the non-theistic religion, uh, religious traditions, there are those who, uh, the, the, uh, religions which uh, assert some kind of uh, independent or uh, uh, personal self, which is permanent, uh, single, and autonomous. Um, but the difference between these uh, other religious traditions, world religions, and Buddhism is the understanding or the view of dependent origination of things. So if you are a Buddhist, if you are a Buddhist, then what you must understand is this unique feature or the unique characteristic of Buddhism, which is dependent origination. And um, I've always been telling um, people everywhere, um, especially the Buddhists, that uh, they must be, become 21st century Buddhists. And uh, um, of course, um, you, you, uh, people usually, um, when they say they are Buddhists, um, you, you uh, think in terms of who your parents are, what religion they follow, and accordingly, you may say that uh, you are Buddhist or this, uh, belong to this or that religion because of your parents, but that must not be our reason. And uh, um, we must not be carried away by blind faith, but we must understand the, the work, the framework, the broad uh, framework of Buddhism and uh, the teaching of the Buddha. And uh, for that, we must use reasoning so, uh, so that we uh, draw our inspiration and our faith based on reason. And that is uh, the, the type of person uh, which we call the, the, those with sharp faculty, uh, those who use reason to bring about faith in their uh, religion. And so you must also be, uh, become a 21st century Buddhist in the sense of um, developing this kind of reason-based faith in the teaching of the Buddha. So what we must uh, try to um, develop is this reason-based faith in the teaching of the Buddha and uh, not just uh, uh, follow Buddhism as custom, saying that uh, my, your parents are uh, Buddhist and therefore you are Buddhist and so forth. Even scientists today, they find Buddhism to have lots of reason and uh, 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 making sense that, and uh, to them as well. Even some scientists go to the length of saying that they are not um, like uh, believers as such, but then um, they, they follow, uh, they, they, they believe in a rebirth um, as well, which is also taught in Buddhism. And therefore, um, and, uh, as Buddhists, we must be uh, able to understand this unique feature of the teaching of the Buddha. And uh, therefore, um, the, the reason why why I gave this introductory talk is in order for you to understand that this is what I uh, consider that you should um, um, understand, that um, it should be important to understand that you have to develop this uh, reason-based faith in the teaching of the Buddha. Of course, I'm not trying to boast uh, to you that I know so much about Buddhism and all that, but I wish that you could become Buddhists uh, based on your understanding of the teaching of the Buddha through reason. And um, um, I have, when I visit some Himalayan regions, I used to interact with people. Um, I have interacted with people, and I have one time asked uh, some people um, which um, a religion they follow, and uh, then they say they are Buddhist, and then uh, when I asked them, what is Buddhism? And then they replied to me that Buddhism is about the practice of taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And then when I asked them further, um, what is a Buddha? Who is a Buddha? There was no answer. And then, um, 
when, um, when I uh, still um, asked um, uh, again um, whether the Buddha uh, and the other um, uh, because the, the uh, Brahma and Ishvara and so forth are same or different and these people have answered to me that they are same which shows the, to, uh, the, the ignorance about the, uh, the, the teaching of the Buddha how, what a Buddha is and how, a Buddha, how someone becomes a Buddha and so forth and so this must not be our case we must try to develop our understanding of Buddhism and uh, therefore the Buddha himself has said you know, if you turn to page three, uh, there is this verse which says, um, O big shoes and the wise, just as gold is tested through burning, cutting, and rubbing, likewise examine my te uh, words thoroughly and only then accept them, not merely out of respect for me. And so we must also follow what the Buddha has said, that um, by using logic and reason, um, we must um, draw conclusions about the teaching of the Buddha. And uh, we, um, when we use logic, what, uh, what we must try to find is whether the teaching of the Buddha contradicts um, the reality uh, and the, uh, whether the teaching of the Buddha contradicts reason or not. If it contradicts reason and experiment and so forth, then we must not take them literally. And uh, therefore, of course, many religions of the world, um, uh, in, in, many, in m many of the religions of the world, what we find mentioned is that the Teach, the founder teachers have said that they must, uh, the, the, the followers or the disciples must believe what they have said. And uh, whereas the, in the Buddha's case, it's different. He has given us this, um, um, the, um, the freedom to check his own teaching, examine his own teaching. And therefore, um, of course, I'm not saying that uh, Buddhism is the best religion. I never say that. And um, um, whether some religion is best for somebody or not, it's an individual case. Uh, we must uh, look at which, uh, whether that particular teaching or the, the religion is most suited and most beneficial to someone or not. So if a, a particular religion is most beneficial to someone, then that could be considered as the best religion for that person. And we cannot generalize or um, uh, say that uh, this religion is best and that religion is um, best, we, we have to check individually. And uh, uh, that, therefore, um, what we must always, uh, in, in terms of the teaching of the Buddha, uh, what is important is, is to use reason and logic to uh, see um, whether things, uh, whether the teachings of the Buddha are in consonance with reason or not. And so because of the importance of reason um, to do analysis into the uh, reality of things, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in ancient Indian uh, in, uh, thoughts, tradition, uh, philosophical traditions, there is so many um, uh, texts that are written on, on, on logic, uh, whether it's Buddhist texts or non-Buddhist texts. There are so many of them which use logic because of the importance of reason. And uh, the uh, text, for example, within in the Buddhist uh, uh, tradition, we have masters like Dignaka, Dharmakirti, uh, Master Chandrakshita, and uh, Kamalashila, and who have written all these great texts on Pramana, the um, uh, logic and epistemology. And uh, there are many translations of these texts, uh, the, 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 the translations of these texts by uh, these masters, such as um, the uh, Master Dignaka's Pramana Samuchaya. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, other texts on logic and epistemology, and then also Master Tamakirti's uh, seven texts on logic and epistemology, and also Master Chandrakshita's um, text on logic and epistemology called uh, Tatu Samgraha, and uh, his uh, disciple Kamala Shila's commentary uh, to the difficult points of this particular text by uh, Chandrakshita. And so, um, uh, what this shows 
is that the past Tibetan masters have actually taken a keen interest in uh, and learning and using reason and logic. Um, and so um, if you know these, um, uh, the, 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 process, the, uh, the system of logic or the, uh, how uh, logic is used, then um, what it can help is to make you very, uh, to, to, to do critical analysis into things. And you makes you very intelligent and sharp in, um, in your approach to uh, doing analysis into things. And therefore, uh, this is something that um, the, the, the complete texts of these masters have been translated into Tibetan only and not in other um, Buddhist langu uh, languages of other uh, Buddhist countries like Chinese and so forth. But uh, in Tibetan, we have all these the texts on logic and epistemology written by these masters. And these should be considered as our treasure. And so these are, um, we can read them in our own language and therefore we must put efforts to pay attention and take interest in studying these texts on logic. So um, I usually tell pe uh, people everywhere that the Tibetan Buddhist tradition is an authentic Nalan um, tradition of the Nalanda Monastic University. And um, uh, this is true, if, uh, you'll find it to be true if you read the texts that we have in translation in the uh, Tenju and Kanju uh, 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 canonical uh, literature. And so um, if you read them carefully and understand Stand and you will see um, how Tibetan Buddhism is in, 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 in really in the, um, is, uh, has, uh, is the authentic Nalanda tradition. So um, how this uh, authentic Nalanda tradition came to Tibet um, is that in the 8th century at the invitation of um, the Tibetan king um, uh, Tsesung Detsen um, the two great Indian masters, uh, Master Shandarakshita, uh, whom we uh, refer to as Kenshin uh, Shiwatsu, or the great abbot or Upadhyaya, um, Shandarakshita, and then also Master, um, the precious guru, uh, the Guru Padma Sambhava. And so these two great masters of India were invited to Tibet by the Tibetan king, and therefore they uh, gathered in uh, and we usually refer to the trio as Ken Lop Chusum. And so Ken referring to Shandarakshita, Lop means master, uh, Padma Sambhava, and Chus for uh, the religious king, uh, Chisum Gertsen. And so in order to establish uh, the, this authentic Nalanda tradition in Tibet, uh, on the Tibetan soil, um, Master Shandarakshita took the main responsibility of teaching uh, Buddhism um, to the Tibetans and also um, establishing the monastic ordination um, and, uh, uh, tradition and then also um, uh, looking after and supervising the translation of text as well. And uh, then in order to, for him to be able to carry out this work um, in Tibet, um, he, uh, he had the help, uh, the able help of Master Padma Thambhava uh, who mainly uh, was responsible for overcoming all the kinds of obstacles to the establishment of Buddhism in Tibet, obstacles um, from the humans as well as non-human uh, spirits and so forth who were otherwise hindering the spread of Buddhism in Tibet. And so without Master Padmasambhava's help uh, to overcome um, these um, evil spirits and humans who are against the uh, Dharma, um, the Master Shandarakshita would not have been able to carry out his work of establishing and teaching and, and establishing the monastic ordination system and also helping with the translation of the texts into Tibetan. And so due to the thanks of these two great masters who themselves were from the Nalanda um, uh, monastic institution, uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism, uh, therefore uh, the Buddhism was established uh, in Tibet and therefore uh, for these reasons we can call the, the Tibetan Buddhism to be the authentic tradition of the Nalanda institution. And uh, then um, of course, let, um, after these uh, great masters, uh, uh, the, 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 these three great personalities established Buddhism on the Tibetan soil, then um, we have uh, the uh, 
the later tradition. So with these, uh, with these three masters, uh, the, 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 the personalities, we have the establishment of the Nyingma tradition in Tibet, and then later on, the other Tibetan Buddhist traditions, such as Sakya, Gayu, and then um, uh, Kadam tradition, as well as the uh, uh, Gedan or the Geluk tradition, also um, were uh, uh, evolved in Tibet. And the, if you look at the um, in, in the history, uh, the masters, the Indian masters, who actually became the teachers, the main teachers of these, uh, the, the Tibetan masters who established these traditions, uh, they were the, those Indian masters were all from the Nalanda uh, monastic institution, and therefore all these Tibetan Buddhist traditions um, um, uh, the, uh, the follow the, Nal the authentic Nalanda tradition, and then within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, uh, where, uh, after the coming of uh, after the coming of Master uh, Atisha, um, Master. Sh uh, sh uh, uh, Adisha to Tibet in the 11th century, uh, the uh, Gadam tradition was established, and uh, Master Adisha himself wrote the text um, called The Lamp for the Path to Enlightenment, which later became the basis for uh, what is known uh, as the Lamrim tradition in Tibet. And uh, if you look at the different Tibetan Buddhist traditions, we have the texts that follow the Lamrim, um, uh, the, the, uh, the tradition, established by Master Atisha, such as uh, the uh, text written by, um, in the Nyingma tradition, we have the, what is known as the, uh, the three, uh, the tri trilogy, tri uh, trilogy of um, ease and comfort, and then, um, in the Kagyu tradition, we have the text uh, called uh, the Jewel Ornament of Liberation by, um, by Gampopa. And uh, then in the Sakya tradition, um, we have the text um, which uh, deal with what are known as the three visions. All these texts follow the Lamrim, um, the, 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 the layout uh, fall, um, is in the Lamrim, um, the, the follow is the Lamrim tradition established by uh, Master Atisha. And then uh, later on, uh, uh, in the uh, for, for 4th and 15th centuries, uh, Master uh, Tsongkhapa came to Tibet and, uh, and, uh, and then um, he established, uh, after him came the Gaiden tradition or the Geluk tradition and he wrote uh, uh, different texts on the stages of the path, the Lamrim, um, the, following the uh, basic text by Master Atisha as well as uh, different commentaries by Kadamba masters. And so based on these texts, he wrote the uh, different Lamrim texts, the great stages of the path and so forth. And the essence of all these um, texts that he wrote is what we are going to follow, these three, uh, the, uh, three principal aspects of the path, which which was in fact written as a, in the form of a letter to one of his disciples. And so this is what we are going to um, go through today. And so uh, regarding the three principles or the three principal aspects of the path, um, the the, 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 how the teaching is dealt with, the three principal aspects of the past is dealt with in this text and in the Lamrim text is different. In the Lamrim, usual Lamrim text, um, the, the stages of the path text, what we find is uh, the Lamrim is uh, written for the benefit of three types of beings. Um, so uh, the, the way it's the, uh, the approach is to benefit the, these three types of beings, the three types of uh, intellectual. Um, so three types of beings, uh, uh, what is beneficial to these three types of beings, meaning beings with small uh, capacity or faculty and medium and uh, superior faculty. So in accordance with the, uh, the need of these three types of beings, the Lamrim texts are laid out. Whereas um, uh, the, the, in, uh, in this text by Master Tsongkhapa, uh, the approach is slightly different. Now, um, what we find in Nagarjuna's text, uh, called the Ratnavali, um, the jewel uh, garland. Um, 
is Master Nagarjuna says the teaching of the Buddha basically is to attain, uh, is meant to attain higher rebirth and then ultimately, uh, or, or uh, then also that of what is known as the uh, definite goodness or liberation and enlightenment. And so the Lamrim, the, 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 the three principal parts is mainly focusing on this point of how we should go out of this samsara and reach omniscient state or liberation. And um, um, of course, when we talk about liberation, we also have uh, uh, when we when we base our practice uh, for liberation and uh, freedom from samsara and also all defilements. Uh, the practice of the three trainings also come in here. And so, with regard to the practice of morality, um, what uh, the practice of morality is basically uh, constitute is uh, the restraint, showing restraints um, or, or of harming others and uh, refraining from harming others and uh, therefore um, when we talk about morality we are thinking of not harming others and keeping that precept of not harming others and uh, that comes along with uh, uh, within the practice of uh, developing the path to liberation and uh, the, the main um, uh, path or the means to reach that highest uh, the, the liberation um, is uh, of course um, uh, uh, we, we should practice bodhicitta in order to reach on the all-knowing uh, state of Buddhahood and um, uh, the, that bodhicitta is also rooted in um, love and compassion or loving kindness and compassion and uh, the, when we uh, develop bodhicitta uh, we have to develop these two principles as well love and compassion and compassion here is uh, the uh, main uh, thing that we develop in developing bodhicitta and in order to develop bodhicitta we have to develop compassion. Now, uh, compassion is this attitude or the wish to, um, the, uh, to, for others to be uh, free from suffering. And now when you uh, wish to develop this attitude of wishing others to be out of suffering, what is important to, uh, for us is to actually understand and um, be aware of what suffering actually is. Because if you don't know the suffering itself, you cannot actually um, Called, um, have this um, the, the, the real genuine sense of wishing others to be out free from suffering and now in order to uh, go, um, the think of others to be free from suffering we, uh, we have to know suffering that is within ourselves and therefore we have to actually acknowledge and become aware of the condition that we are also in, that we are in the uh, condition of suffering. And uh, therefore, by becoming aware of one's own suffering, if you are able to become aware of your own suffering, then uh, it would be much more effective when you uh, develop the compassion towards others. And therefore, one has to develop this wish to be free from suffering for oneself first. And that is what is known as the thought of definite emergence um, uh, uh, or uh, usually translated as uh, renunciation. Now, um, you, when you want uh, to, uh, when you wish to uh, go develop renunciation from samsara, from samsara, um, uh, this uh, the cycle of existence, one must be aware of suffering and therefore wish to be um, out of this suffering. And uh, for within this process now, what we have is where we are going to lead our ourselves too, that is liberation, and um, the means to lead there are the three different trainings. And uh, the, uh, uh, by, by applying and cultivating the three trainings, the higher trainings of morality, concentration, and wisdom, what we actually develop is this uh, deep insight, uh, penetrative insight into the real nature of the mind itself as well. And therefore, uh, seeing uh, the, the uh, nature of the mind, the, the true nature of the mind itself, actually helps to dissolve these delusions that are within us, within that reality reality or the suchness of the mind and uh, uh, the, uh, we are here not only looking for mere liberation from uh, the, uh, the this conditioned existential suffering of samsara and we are not looking for mere freedom from the uh, 
afflictive thoughts and emotions, uh, which are the causes of suffering. But um, in in context of developing the bodhicitta, what we are looking at is also that um, uh, that of the full enlightenment or Buddhahood, where you not only overcome the delusions that are within our mind, these defilements, these, such as the three poisons and so forth, but you are also looking to overcome even the residual stains of these defilements that are within our mind. So, um, which means to attain what is known as the Svabhavakaya, Buddhahood, uh, this total freedom from all uh, defilements uh, in the mind. And so that's uh, what we are looking for. And therefore, in, in order to reach that goal of enlightenment, Buddhahood, what we must develop, first of all, this thought of renunciation, wishing to be free from samsara, and, and then also develop love and compassion, which in turn leads to uh, the, uh, the uh, experience of bodhicitta, this altruistic um, en enlightened, uh, spirit of enlightenment to reach Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. And now having developed these two, is, uh, it's not enough um, to develop these two principles of renunciation and thought of renunciation and bodhicitta, but these must in turn be uh, complemented or helped by uh, the wisdom realizing the real nature of things, um, and which means how things are designated, dependently designated, and therefore they are empty of um, independent existence. And so um, the, the, the using this uh, wisdom, realizing the, the things uh, to be dependently originated, dependently designated, then we should um, be able to develop this wish to be out of suffering and also bodhicitta. And so therefore the wisdom, the, the, this, uh, the, uh, the, the critical acumen that we use to develop the path um, is very essential in, uh, in the practice um, and, and, and therefore uh, it is very important to, to gain understanding and insight into emptiness, empty nature of things. And uh, so uh, in this way, this understanding will lead you to overcome the defilements that are within the mind. And when we develop this wisdom and see the reality as it is without any kind of uh, uh, cognitive uh, veil in, in your mind, then what happens is these uh, defilements themselves dissolve into the, the very nature of the mind itself, which is to say to reach uh, the, the cessation. And so in this way you develop the path of renunciation, bodhicitta, and then uh, these are held by the view. And within the view, of course, we have the view of, uh, within Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhism, we also have what is known as the four seals of the Buddha's teaching, which also is about the view. Um, uh, which are to say that uh, all composite things are uh, impermanent and everything that is defiled is in the nature of suffering and uh, then um, the, 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 uh, everything is uh, without any self and nirvana is peace. And so um, the, the view that we are talking about here is mainly this deep understanding into how things are empty of an independent um, existence. And so uh, to go through the text itself on page 124, um, it says the three principles are uh, principles of the path and then uh, homage to the gurus. And then the, the first verse after that shows the, is the pledge to compose the text. And then the second verse is uh, to urging uh, the verse um, the first verse, uh, let me just read through the text. I bow down to the venerable gurus. I will explain. The first verse begins by saying, I will explain as well as I am able to as the essence of all the teachings of the conqueror, the path praised by the conqueror's children, and the entrance for the fortunate who desire liberation. So that verse is uh, the pledge to compose the text. And then the next verse, uh, which is... Um, 
the verse urging the, the, the author, Master Tongkapa, urging the, the disciples who listen to the, te to listen to the teaching, the disciples who are receptive uh, to the teaching, uh, urging them to listen. And uh, it says, listen with a clear mind, you fortunate ones who are not attached to the joys of cyclic existence, who strive to make you good use of leisure and opportunity, and direct your mind to the path pleasing the Buddhas. And then uh, the next verse, which says, without um, a pure determination to be free, there is no way to end attraction to the pleasures of cyclic existence. The craving for existence also binds beings. Thus, from the onset, seek renunciation, reverse attraction to this life. And uh, the, so this first verse shows the reason why we must cultivate renunciation. And uh, the, uh, so within this context, of course, when we talk about thought, the cultivating renunciation or thought of renouncing samsara, we must think about uh, the suffering nature of samsara. And so within suffering, of course, there are three kinds of suffering, uh, which are known as the suffering of suffering or the painful experiences that are obvious to us as being uh, uh, suffering and miserable misery. And then um, th th there is also the second type of suffering, which um, is known as the, uh, the uh, suffering of change or change of suffering. Um, and, uh, so these two are not the main focus in, um, the, uh, over in, in thinking of renunciation from samsara. We are not uh, thinking only of overcoming these two types of suffering because the first type of suffering, the painful suffering, um, uh, uh, suffering of pain, is something even the animals are aware of being, as being something unwanted. And then the, regarding the second type of suffering, the suffering of change, um, even the, uh, those who do not follow the Buddhist tradition as such, they are aware of as, uh, the, this kind of suffering as being unwanted. Um, and therefore, what we uh, must understand when we t t talk about overcoming suffering within the context of the teaching of the Buddha is the third type of suffering, the deeper type of suffering, which is called the existential pervasive existence. Existential contingent suffering, um, and so um, th these kind of suffering happens um, under the influence of our negative thoughts and emotions, delusions, and so so long as a birth uh, uh, is under the influence of these uh, delusions, that kind of birth is of suffering. The very existence itself is terms as the pervasive conditioned existential suffering. So this is what we um, actually target at to, uh, when we think about developing or cultivating renunciation. And therefore, when you, ha uh, having given thought to this kind of suffering, deeper suffering of uh, the existence itself, which is brought about through by delusion, um, and, and when you uh, pursue the path or the, that goal of total freedom from this kind of suffering, then um, you, you have actually uh, developed the wish also, to, uh, you, when you aspire to reach that goal, then you have uh, uh, developed the genuine sense of uh, renunciation as well. So in, this is what uh, in Buddhism um, is referred to as thinking of um, in, in terms of renunciation. And then the next verse says, by reflecting on how leisure and opportunity are difficult to find, and how life is ephemeral and without span, reverse attraction to future lives, by repeatedly thinking of the infallibility of karma and its effects, and the misery of samsara. And so what this verse is showing is that, um, uh, showing is how one uh, should develop this thought of renunciation by uh, thinking about the ephemeral nature of the, uh, the, 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 this very life being impermanent and, and, um, and also thinking about the, uh, the suffering uh, nature of this life. And, uh, and 
So by, by uh, re reflecting on the lesion opportunity and the difficulty of finding such a human life, and then how this life is ephemeral in span, then you, you actually reverse your thought or uh, turn your mind away from the pleasures of this life. And then um, you also um, reverse the attraction towards the future lives as well. Uh. And so, um, with regards to um, overcoming uh, the uh, attraction or reversing your attraction to future lives, um, in order to be able to do that, we, we must focus or uh, think about the uh, infallibility of the law of causality, karma, and also um, uh, the uh, suffering nature of samsara the cycle of existence. And so uh, when we talk about this uh, karma, karma means action. And so um, when, when we talk about actions bringing about their effects, then um, what we, we also come uh, to understand is that an uh, action, when we talk about action, um, the, these actions bringing about pain and pleasure um, uh, happen um, when uh, we have beings who have uh, sensation or uh, feelings. And so on the basis of of this experience um, that we have, then we talk about pain and pleasure being, uh, being brought about through karma. And, um, and here uh, it is very clearly mentioned in uh, Master Shandideva's Shandi uh, Shandi um, The Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, where he uh, goes through the point of how a certain flower, like a lotus, um, has different, uh, its shape, color, fragrance, and so forth. And he, he says these are um, due to its own, uh, their own causes and conditions. And the, the shape and the color and smell or the fragrance of the uh, a lotus um, are due to their own um, the different conditions. And then, um, having said that um, he goes further to um, point out that um, the, although these are due to their uh, respective uh, causes and conditions, but then uh, when it comes to the beginningless suffering and uh, pain and pleasure, they come about through their own causes uh, or um, the karma. Now, uh, here, of course, we can talk about calm, uh, the, the ple uh, pain and pleasure in terms of how they are related to certain experience that uh, beings actually uh, feel and undergo. And so uh, we can talk about environment, uh, the, our karma having some effect on the environment, and therefore we also uh, experience certain, uh, go through ex certain experiences uh, uh, based on such karma that ripen or that um, uh, mature in the form of the environment. But basically, um, of course, there is some connection between our experience of pain and pleasure and as beings and the environment. But in generally speaking, Master Shanda Deva is saying that um, the, uh, the uh, different color and shape and fragrance and so forth of the lotus is due to uh, the different uh, causes and conditions that preceded it. And when he further, uh, when he's, he is further asked, then where do those causes and conditions arise from? Then he uh, responds by saying that they also come through from their own causes and conditions, respective causes and conditions. And so uh, in this way, uh, this is talking about the general law of causality, uh, which is very similar to the Darwinian theory of evolution as well, that things come from their own own causes and conditions and uh, which precede them. Um, and so in the external world, of course, we have the matters that come from their own causes and conditions. And in, uh, internally, uh, as in, in within the sentient beings, our body, for example, has its own causes and conditions which are material. And therefore, the, these matters that are within us, our body, uh, if you trace, um, if you uh, try to look, uh, check where they come from, we find that you find that they come from their own causes and conditions which have preceded them. 
time. And um, the, the, uh, here we are talking about the material continuity of the things. And so uh, they, the, in terms of the material continuity of things, they have their own, the, this body has its own material continuity in a pre previous moment of the body and so forth. And, and we can go back to the Big Bang, for example, and therefore the material continuity of the body that we have, the uh, external environment and so forth, have uh, uh, come uh, from the Big Bang and even before that, perhaps. And so in this way, um, and, and because of this now, uh, Master uh, Aryadeva has said in his 400 verses that um, things um, uh, have no beginning as such. We cannot uh, pinpoint the beginning of things, but then there is an end to the things. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, when we uh, check and when we look at the mat material world, we can see that mit uh, the different things are brought about uh, uh, by their own causes and conditions conditions which have similarity to them, which are concordant to them or um, uh, conducive to produce those effects. And similarly, it is the case with the consciousness or the minds that we have. And, uh, for example, if we uh, uh, if we think about uh, the visual consciousness, how a visual consciousness is produced, um, uh, in order to, when we look at something physical, something uh, which has form and shape and all that, um, what happens is the object um, forms, uh, the object serves as the object focus, the focus to bring about the, the, the material, um, uh, the consciousness the, which sees it. And then there is also within our um, eyes, there. Uh, uh, within the the uh, organ, eye organ, there is the faculty, the uh, what is known as the visual faculty, and so that faculty serves as what is known as the empowering condition. It is the dominant um, called. Um, um, empowering condition to bring about the visual consciousness whereas even with these two factors it's not certain that uh, the, the, the uh, certain visual consciousness will arise and therefore what is needed is a consciousness which actually um, arises in the form of that visual consciousness and therefore uh, the uh, visual consciousness must have a preceding moment of uh, uh, consciousness that serves as its substantial cause and therefore what we uh, have to understand is that the mere uh, nature of the mind being clear and knowing uh, can bring about as its substantial or uh, its um, effect in the form of uh, consciousness, which has the same uh, characteristic, same features of clarity and no, um, called, uh, cognitive nature. And so, apart from something which has these two qualities, um, uh, the, the uh, knowing and uh, clarity, and uh, the matter cannot become substantial cause of. Uh, the uh, consciousness and, uh, and therefore uh, even at the time of a conception. Uh, so if you think along this line that uh, the consciousness is brought about uh, uh, by a substantial cause which is also in the nature of knowing and clarity and therefore if you were to look for the beginning of such a uh, thing you will, it, will be, it would be difficult to find the beginning of consciousness. And, uh, and then in terms of the, when, when, a, when a somebody conceives in a mother's womb and of course there is the embryo the, the embryo starts there and so in order for that embryo to start also there should be this consciousness which conceives in the mother's womb uh, for the embryo to grow as uh, and, uh, fetus and then uh, child and so forth and um, and so um, Master Dhammakirti says that something which is not a consciousness cannot be a substantial cause of a consciousness. And so um, uh, uh, what this means is that consciousness must be brought about by a substantial cause, which is also a consciousness, which has this nature of clarity and knowing. And therefore, with that um, consciousness, what happens is we have motivation in us. I mean, beings are motivated to do something, to uh, 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 have some motivation, and that motivation 
motivation, which is a mental process which, uh, with, with, with which you create a mental karma or action, and then that in turn brings about the physical action as well as the verbal actions um, in us. And therefore, uh, the point here is to, uh, 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 that I wish to make is that the karma has, when we talk about karma and action, that has to have a certain um, call, uh, motivation which actually brings it about or creates it. And therefore, uh, the, uh, apart from the karma, of course, the uh, general law of causality is something universal in uh, all kinds of objects that are brought about by causes and conditions. But then when it comes to talking about karma, bringing about pain and pleasure, it has to do with certain motivation, certain experience that is within a being, which who creates that karma. And so, um, having uh, explained about how to revert your mind or turn it away from the uh, samsara, um, now, uh, in, term, in, the, in relation to cultivating the thought of renunciation, now, in the actual um, practice of cultivating renunciation, it would be uh, very uh, effective if you could use um, what is uh, said in uh, verse number th uh, 3 on page 126 on, in this booklet uh, from Tibet House, where it says, Swept by the suffering of the, uh, swept by the current of the four powerful rivers, tied by strong bonds of karma so hard to undo, caught in the iron net of self grasping, completely enveloped by the darkness of ignorance, born and reborn in boundless cyclic existence, ceaselessly tormented by the three miseries, thinking of your mothers in this condition generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. Now, in terms of, uh, in the context of generating or cultivating the thought of renunciation, what you would um, uh, switch the, uh, here is, um, with, with regard to the last two lines here, thinking of your, um, uh, you, you refer to yourself, my own condition, this condition, I generate this thought of renunciation. So you can um, uh, switch these two lines um, for renunciation and then do the meditation accordingly. And so um, when uh, here uh, the, the four powerful rivers could be uh, referred to uh, as those of uh, birth, aging, sickness and death, and then uh, you are tied uh, by the strong bonds of karma, which are un uh, difficult to undo, and then uh, with regard to the next line, caught in the iron net of self-grasping. Here, self-grasping could be understood in terms of grasping at the self-existence ex uh, of persons, self of persons, uh, whether uh, first beginning with the understanding of the grosser level of self um, grasping and uh, called, uh, selflessness of persons, and uh, then uh, also going into the uh, the more subtle level of understanding selflessness of persons, and then um, the the next line uh, referring to ignorance, darkness of ignorance uh, could be understood in terms of the, uh, this uh, ignorance which grasps at the self of uh, phenomena, um, and so you should uh, overcome it by understanding the emptiness of this uh, phenomena. And uh, then um, what happens to us is that because of our uh, this strong grasping at the self and uh, independent existence of oneself and other uh, things. Um, we, uh, when we look at things, of course things, there are beautiful things and bad and good things, but then due to our clinging to something that we consider to be bad and uh, called, uh, focusing on that further and further, more and more, what happens is this clinging to the badness of thing or the goodness of thing increases and there's this exaggeration of the badness or the goodness or attractiveness uh, and the ugliness in things. And so due to that, then we create the karma. And uh, through that karma, um, we are called bound, uh, uh, bind ourselves in samsara and we are born again and again in this boundless samsara. And, uh, um, and therefore, 
uh, ceaselessly, uh, we are we are ceaselessly tormented by these three types of suffering: the painful suffering, the changeable suffering, or the suffering of change, and the, uh, the uh, pervasive conditioned existential suffering. And uh, uh, therefore, um, one should. Uh, Mm. Uh, now, having having used this verse to um, in this way to uh, cultivate uh, renunciation for thinking about one's own condition of suffering, then uh, on verse number. Um, uh, on page Oh, uh, first, um, you, you, you think about the suffering of yourself, um, that you are the condition that you are in, in samsara, that you are in the nature of suffering, uh, since time beginningless, and you uh, try to develop this thought of renunciation, wishing to be uh, free from this samsara, and then uh, that in turn uh, the, uh, is the same wish to be out of suffering should be um, uh, covered on others, turned to others, and you uh, develop uh, compassion, which is the wish for others to be out of suffering. So in this way, uh, when you think about the suffering of oneself and you wish to want to uh, go out of it, you uh, degenerate or cultivate renunciation. And when you wish to uh, turn your mind towards others and wish uh, them to be free from suffering, you uh, actually cultivate compassion. And therefore, in this way, um, you uh, call, uh, generate uh, uh, this uh, renunciation. Uh, think about uh, the suffering nature of oneself and um, uh, then uh, on uh, the page number 20, 126 the first verse um, uh, which says contemplating thus when you do not for an instant admire the splendors of cyclic existence and remain intent on liberation day and night renunciation is then born in you and so what this shows is the measure of having completed your cultivation of uh, renunciation uh, this thought to be free from samsara so now here uh, when we think about the uh, the uh, suffering nature of oneself and others I mean, when we talk about it and uh, what happens to us usually is if we look in the world, what people are actually uh, attracted towards or run after is sensorial pleasure. And they try to um, run after them, the sensorial pleasure, and then um, try to draw satisfaction. But then the more we try to draw satisfaction based on these sensorial experiences alone, we get into more trouble. And therefore, um, and call, um, even, even though we are born as human beings, which is considered a higher rebirth, and our, uh, physically, we may be human beings, but because of our obsession with the, uh, the sensorial pleasure, the, the, the sensual pleasures, and uh, so much so that we are almost like animals, and um, mentally, we could be considered ourselves as being like animals. And so that's what we don't want. And therefore, what we have to also see is uh, the, the how the, 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 there is in the world the painful experiences that we consider as suffering and also those experiences which we also consider as being pleasant and pleasurable even though they are very ephemeral and changeable and uh, the, these pleasures change into suffering and but we are not because of our obsession with the essential uh, pleasures we are not able to see them as in the uh, in the nature of be being in the nature of suffering and because of that we are um, actually deceived by these uh, the appearances, these uh, apparent uh, pleasure and pleasant things and experiences, and therefore we suffer more and more. And therefore, um, we should see the essencelessness of um, this kind of clinging and obsession with the sensual pleasures and try to develop the true um, happiness um, within ourselves, and uh, therefore uh, the the uh, called, uh, the root of suffering must be understood, which is the uh, that of 
uh, ignorance, which is uh, basically uh, the mainly the ignorance which, uh, which sees distorted nature of thing, reality. And therefore, we must try to overcome them by developing wisdom, which sees the selflessness nature of things. And then, um, in order to develop, having, having understood the uh, selfless nature and empty nature of things, then we should also develop this, uh, the com the, uh, we should combine, the, develop this combination of shamatha and vipassana. And for that, of course, we have to develop concentration, single-pointed concentration, in order to be able to combine our wisdom understanding with that uh, uh, concentration so that we have this combined experience of uh, shamatha and vipassana. And then in order to develop this single-pointed concentration, we further need to base ourselves on moral principles and avoid the negative actions. And therefore, we also need the basis, which is the moral morality. And in this way, we should uh, help ourselves um, to, to, uh, go, uh, to go out of the suffering of samsara. Oh, yeah. And then uh, verse number two on page 126, um, renunciation, however, if not tempered by a pure mind of uh, enlightenment, does not bring forth the perfect bliss of unsurpassed enlightenment. Therefore, the wise ones generate the excellent mind of enlightenment. And so... Um, here, what is uh, being shown is the reason why we must cultivate uh, bodhicitta, this altruistic intention to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings. And, uh, um, and then, now, uh, in order to uh, in order to cultivate bodhicitta uh, within ourselves, um, of course, uh, the, uh, the teaching also goes through how uh, the uh, next verse shows how we uh, actually go about with the cultivation of bodhicitta. No. And uh, so the, the next verse is swept by the current of the four river, powerful rivers um, which we read earlier, this whole verse uh, ending with generate the supreme mind of enlightenment. And so uh, it says swept by the current of the four powerful rivers tied by the strong bonds of karma so hard to undo, caught in the iron net of self-grasping, completely enveloped by the darkness of ignorance, born and reborn in boundless cycles existence, ceaselessly tormented by the three miseries, thinking of your mothers in this condition, generates supreme mind of enlightenment. And so this shows how we go about with the cultivation of bodhicitta. And then with regard to um, the bodhic uh, with regard to the measure of having uh, completed your uh, cultivation or development of bodhicitta, when you have genuine bodhicitta, um, the, the, this is, has to be understood um, uh, by uh, extending the same uh, logic that is uh, uh, used for uh, renunciation as well. And so here, what uh, in the process, in the um, practice of cultivating uh, the path to enlightenment. Um, we, we must base ourselves um, uh, on morality, which f serves as the foundation of our uh, practice. And then uh, we should develop concentration and uh, uh, single-pointed concentration and wisdom, realizing emptiness or selflessness. And uh, um, uh, 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 here, of course, if you um, have uh, some understanding and insight or understanding of uh, selflessness or emptiness uh, with the wish or the aim to only overcome the, uh, the uh, mental, uh, what is known as the delusions or afflictive thoughts and emotions, then um, when you use that understanding merely for that purpose, uh, you actually reach uh, a state where you would, you would be completely free from uh, the samsara, and whereas um, in order for that wisdom to um, uh, serve as a course to reach full enlightenment of Buddhahood, we also must uh, be able to use that 
to overcome what is known as the uh, obsc uh, cognitive obscuration or obscuration to total knowledge of, of Buddhahood. And so in order to be able to do that, you have to uh, com uh, complement it or su uh, support that insight into emptiness um, with, uh, by, it has to be supported by bodhicitta. And so with the help of bodhicitta, that understanding of emptiness on the basis of the foundation of um, morality, um, you'll be able to uh, um, journey towards that final goal of enlightenment, the total uh, um, enlightenment or the com uh, um, complete enlightenment of Buddhahood. And so um, I mentioned about the, uh, what the, 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 the these different defilements that are, are within our minds, such as those of delusions or uh, negative thoughts and emotions or destructive emotions, and also the cognitive obscurations, and then uh, also what would come later in this text, um, regarding these points that will come later, um, you should not be satisfied only with the very uh, few texts or uh, you may study one text and think that uh, regarding the, uh, the presentation or the explanation of these uh, delusions and the cognitive obscuration may be such and such, but then you, when you uh, uh, encounter or uh, other texts, I mean, you might not understand them very well. Because, uh, so you have to actually study the classic, uh, the classical texts written, the classics written by great Indian masters um, who uh, followed the or, or uh, followed the Chittamatra or mind-only school philosophy, as well as the uh, texts written by the Madhyamaka masters. Within the Madhyamaka masters, of course, there are uh, there, there are those of the uh, Svatantraka Madhyamakas and also the um, Prasangika Madhyamakas. Within the Prasangika Madhyamakas, also uh, the Tantrika Madhyamakas also, there are what in Tibet were termed as higher and lower subtantrika uh, philosoph philosophical traditions and so forth. And so uh, you have to be able to, um, you should study all these different philosophical positions that are found in these great texts uh, written by these great Indian masters who followed the different philosophical traditions um, within the Buddhism, for example. And so um, you cannot just rely on a single text and say, oh, this is the position of this uh, philosophical school and so forth. And so Master Tsongkhapa himself has said that he actually um, and was not satisfied with partial study or very um, rough, uh, roughly studying the different texts written by these great Indian masters who were called, um, uh, who were termed as the six ornaments and the two sublime masters, but he actually studied in great detail, thoroughly, all the different uh, philosophical texts written by the great, these great masters. And so likewise, we should also follow his example and study the different texts written by by other Indian masters like Pal Viveka and so forth, and then uh, gain a very broad uh, knowledge of the philosophical traditions of um, uh, India, Buddh um, uh, the, the uh, ancient Indian thought, uh, Buddhist thought, and also uh, non-Buddhist thoughts uh, based on uh, certain texts which, which are called the presentations of philosophical tenets. Uh, for example, there is one text written by uh, the, uh, one master named Upalosil, and so he has uh, written this text on the philosophical uh, systems of um, uh, ph philosophical systems and uh, if you could study uh, this I mean it would be very helpful to see things in, in, in through critical in critical way and uh, not being satisfied just with a uh, few words or a few explanations very uh, simple explanations but you would be able to you should uh, read this text and then analyze it and also try to uh, compare and contrast uh, his positions, his explanations with others and so forth. In this way, it would be very helpful for you to broaden your knowledge and experience. So, um, next verse is, although you train in 
renunciation and the mind of enlightenment without wisdom which realizes the ultimate reality you cannot cut the root of cyclic existence therefore strive to understand dependent origin uh, arising and so here uh, what this verse shows is um, the, the reason why we must cultivate the uh, wisdom realizing selflessness and um, so uh, the, the Master Tsongkhapa here uses the term dependent arising or dependent origination and he doesn't uh, refer to understanding uh, emptiness or selflessness and so um, uh, if you uh, you might think that of course dependent origination means some things that we see conventionally and how can this actually overcome our clinging to independent uh, these uh, our uh, emotions the negative thoughts and emotions uh, the wrong views and so forth but here you must understand what you must understand is that um, when uh, the Master Tsongkhapa uses this term dependent arising, he is referring to, uh, referring to the subtle uh, understanding of dependence. Um, because when you uh, have the subtle understanding of how things are dependent on other factors, then uh, that will in turn bring about your uh, certainty in um, the empty nature of things, that things are empty of independent existence. And so in this way, it will, that uh, insight will help, the, and the insight into emptiness will help in gaining deeper understanding or insight into the dependent nature nature of things as well, so they, they would be mutually um, uh, uh, complementary in this way. And so here, usually, when I uh, uh, refer to this subtle uh, uh, dependency of things, I use the term um, the suchness, real, uh, the depend suchness of dependent origination. And so what that uh, means is that things are merely designated, that they are nominal merely nominal and that they are designated through dependence and so uh, that is the subtle dependent interdependent nature of things um, so when you uh, understand how things are dependently designated in this subtle way that they are merely nominal then you uh, also see are able to gain cert certainty into how things have no uh, self-existent uh, uh, nature or uh, essence in themselves and therefore it says um, the, in the text the uh, strive to understand dependent origination uh, arising um, and then the next uh, uh, verse says one who sees the infallible uh, cause and effect of all phenomena in cyclic existence and peace uh, nirvana, and uh, destroys all focuses of apprehension has entered into the path which pleases the Buddhas. And so here we uh, the, uh, find mention of cause and effect, the infallibility of cause and effect. Of course, when we think about the relationship between cause and effect, um, we, uh, we see or we usually uh, we are able to see that causes bring about the effects or results. And therefore, the effects that these causes bring about are dependent on the causes, uh, on their causes. But then we don't get the idea of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the fact that the causes are also dependent or related to the effects. Um, or contingent upon the effects as well. Um, but if you think carefully, the mere fact that we can say something is a cause, is because of the effect that the, uh, the, uh, it brings about. And because of that, we have to understand that the, uh, the cause is also for its identity contingent or upon the, um, the effects that it brings about. And uh, therefore, in this way, you have to see that cause and effect are also mutually dependent or related or contingent. And, uh, and we call, um, 
we, we of course, um, when we uh, think about a, uh, when we have a seed and we think about an effect, I mean, of course, we uh, think about something that has to come in the future. But then uh, uh, we don't, we are not able to see that causal relationship, uh, the the relation or the, the relatedness of the cause to its effect. And so this is how we should uh, look at the causes also being uh, related or dependent or contingent. Of, uh, on its effect, um, that the very nature of the cause uh, is because of its effect. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, we can talk about the um, when we do some action, and that action involves a doer, the action itself, and the agent, and then uh, what, uh, where the action is done, and so forth. And so all these things, the object uh, on which the action is being performed, and the actor, and the action itself, all these are also interrelated, interdependent. And similarly, it is the case with, uh, with um, the objects and their perceptions or conceptions or uh, the valid cognitions which see them. They are also in, uh, mutually dependent. And so things have to be seen in terms of mutual dependence in this way. And um, of course, if you, if you were to uh, posit that things have it can be found uh, and have uh, if you uh, actually can, uh, think that there must be some essence in things which we must be able to find when, through analysis and of course there is nothing which we can actually find and uh, if you hold on to that kind of view that there's some essence whatsoever in the things that is objectively there and the, the, uh, holding such a view is not realistic in, um, in the world and so if you hold on to such views uh, many of the things that happen in the world um, uh, the, uh, the different systems and so forth would not be compatible with such a view. And so uh, you would have lots of uh, uh, difficulties holding on to such view that there is something, uh, some kind of an essence in the things which are designated in, in fact. And therefore uh, uh, you should understand that things are designated through dependence or dependent by means of designation um, and that they are nominal the existent. And so um, if you could read chapter 24 of Master Nagarjuna's Fundamental Treatise of the Middle Way, and you will find this point very clearly um, uh, explained there. And, uh, yeah. and so um, the, 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 uh, when you understand the infallibility of the law of causality or karmic causality and what you will also find is that these um, because things are brought about through causes and conditions therefore it, they are feasible and it's feasible to see that they are related or dependent on other factors and through that in turn you will gain insight into emptiness as well and therefore on the basis of understanding the infallibility of causality you, you which is the appearing uh, how things uh, the, the appearance nature of the things then you will be able to uh, see the uh, the empty nature of things as well and so uh, the, that uh, and, uh, called appearance uh, called understanding of how things exist in terms of causality will bring about the uh, the empty uh, understanding of empty nature of things and that in turn will um, should actually uh, bring about the uh, deeper understanding of how things appear to us how things are illusion like uh, if you are not able to uh, complement these two uh, but they happen rather um, as uh, it says in the next verse appearances and infallible are uh, infallible dependent arising and emptiness is the understanding that is free of assertions as long as these two are seen as distinct um, uh, you have not yet realized the intent of the Buddha. So distinct here means that you have these two understandings not complement, being able, not being able to complement each other, but they happen rather alternately. Um, and as long as you are in that situation, um, then um, you have not yet realized the Buddha's intent. And uh, um, when these two realizations are simultaneous, where 
from the mere sight of infallible dependent origination concurrently destroys all modes of grasping through defilement, defi definite discernment. At that time, the analysis of the profound view is perfected. Now, to cultivate this warm heart uh, of bodhicitta, we do, we'll do a ceremony at the end. First, let me finish this, uh, which is always a start. Um, so, uh, the text on page number 129 says, Furthermore, appearances refute the extreme of existence, and emptiness refutes the extreme of non-existence. When you understand that emptiness arises in the form of cause and effect, you are not captivated by the view of extremes. And so, um, and then, uh, finally, uh, Master Tsongkhapa actually exhorts his disciple um, by uh, concluding with this concluding verse. He says, Oh, child, once you have realized the points of the three principles of the path, seek solitude and cultivate strong determination and quickly reach the final uh, goal. And so, um, with this, uh, he shows how he is teaching. When Master Tsongkhapa taught his disciple Tsako um, to, uh, Ngawan to apply himself in the teaching and find seek solitude. Um, and so how, having recent, listened to the teaching, what you must do is, first of all, of course, you have to uh, hear the teachings that from masters and then develop this understanding based on listening or hearing the teaching. And then have, on the basis of that, you should give thought to the teaching uh, again and again so that uh, you would uh, 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 generate or um, develop this wisdom or understanding uh, based on um, um, analysis or thinking or reflecting on the teaching. Um, and then, having done that, um, uh, in, uh, what you must have this deep um, uh, uh, deep uh, certitude or certainty in applying the teaching in meditation and then um, uh, and, uh, develop the wisdom that arises through meditation or um, deeper insight. And so uh, within this experience, of course, there are experiences which are um, like, uh, which come about when you put some effort and uh, then having uh, put effort over a period of of time, it develops into a state where you have this experience, the meditative experience, or the uh, effortlessly. And so uh, this is how you should go about with the practice, through developing the wisdom or understanding uh, based on listening or studying the teaching, and then also reflecting on it, and then through meditation. Um, of course, if you do give thought to the teachings, how to, um, you will be able to make some transformation within. Um, the, uh, uh, you, you don't have to wait until you are able to go into meditation and all that, but even if, uh, even when you have a very uh, uh, good understanding, uh, a correct understanding of the teaching, and uh, then uh, that, in, that, that will in itself bring about some change in you. And this I can tell from my own experience Close. And when you are able to make some transformation within by giving thought to the teachings, um, uh, then uh, the, you will also have a happy life. The, the, there is this onset of happiness in your life. Um, even if you may be surrounded by very difficult circumstances, deep within you will not be swayed by these uh, circumstances, but you'll be able to maintain your happiness. And, uh, and therefore, um, the, the, you should not be content only um, having heard the teaching and um, saying that, oh, this is what the Buddhism says, and not really give thought to it, but you should actually uh, draw this wisdom or understanding based on your study and listening, uh, the, hearing the teaching, and then um, draw the certitude, 100% certitude in the teaching uh, through reflection. 
and um, uh, using your reason and logic and bringing about this certitude uh, through logic uh, uh, called reflection. And uh, the, in my own case, um, I'm now 80, 30, uh, seven, almost 78 years, and uh, I have applied myself in meditation uh, for over 70 years. And uh, because of this uh, constant effort that I have been putting in um, my practice, uh, when I when I think about the fact that things are dependently originated, uh, there is the sense that I have of things being like illusion. And so here, of course, I'm not claiming, making any uh, uh, claims on having um, uh, real experience, genuine experience of emptiness or bodhicitta or anything like that. But however poor I may be in my spiritual experience, I can, I can assure you that I can actually, I have a taste of the teaching of the Buddha in terms of this emptiness and bodhicitta. Um, and so you should also, uh, the, especially the younger generation, and uh, you should keep, give thought to these teachings and not just forget the teaching, but keep uh, thinking over and over on, on about these teachings and the, the principles of dependent origination and all this, and uh, put some effort to make some, t if you wish to make some transformation within, you sh must put effort and give thought to the teachings over and over again. And uh, if you are not really interested in uh, making any transformation within, and you find that it's not possible or impossible for you to do, then uh, the, when you have difficulties Difficulties. I mean, either you uh, go, um, fall asleep, or you can take two drinks, or anything like that. But these will not really help. And so, if you really give thought to the teachings carefully and deeply, and uh, it's, I, I can assure that there's a transformation will happen in you. Oh yeah, that's enough. So we'll do oh. the ceremony for bodhi, uh, bodhicitta. Oh. So in order to do the ceremony for generating bodhicitta, uh, first of all, imagine before you in the space these lines of masters, uh, beginning with the master uh, the, uh, Busta Shakyamuni himself, the founder of Buddhism, and then uh, him being surrounded by the great disciples, Bodhisattva disciples and so forth, and also Master Nagarjuna and his uh, um, uh, disciples and followers, as well as other great masters of Buddhism uh, who have uh, served in the promotion, preservation of and preservation of Buddhism for the last, during the last 2550 uh, plus years. And so with this visualization um, in your mind, please um, follow this ceremony. Hmm? And so um, we have just what we have done is within the visualization we also have done the seven branch practice of prostration, um, then uh, making offering to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the blind masters as well as confession. Then uh, we also made the uh, rejoice and then urging the Buddhas not to pass away and also requesting them to give uh, teachings and then finally dedication. So what we have done is we have dedicated whatever merit we have uh, collected through these uh, first six practices, we have uh, dedicated them for uh, the sake of to become a Buddha. For the and uh, with regard to the sequence that I put uh, the, uh, between the urging the um, uh, Buddhas not to pass away and the requesting them to teach the Dharma, uh, the sequence has to be uh, the, uh, requesting the teach, uh, teachings first and then urging them not to pass away. So in any case, uh, we have dedicated whatever merit we have accumulated through this practice of the six. Uh, the, the, the first uh, six practices um, from prostration through to uh, urging them not to pass away. We have dedicated them for uh, the uh, benefit of all sentient beings so that we may become a Buddha for the, their, their, their sake. And so now with regard to the point uh, that, um, about requesting the teaching, 
um, we do this, uh, we make this prayer to, uh, to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to uh, turn the wheel of Dharma, to give um, the teaching. But Prat then. Practically, all our daily sadhana, no. you see, these uh, seven limbs, no. always there. Uh, so, the, the sixth, right? No. no. So fifth, fifth. Fifth. You see, pl please, you see, give teaching, right? But if you see Buddha, you see, response to us, oh, I give a lot of teaching, but you never pay much attention. Then how? <laughs> how do we answer? <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of teachings there. And as far as the Tibetan translation is concerned, over 300 volumes there. But we just put there as an ornament, right? <laughs> object to worship, yeah. we never pay much attention to read, to study. Uh, meantime, we every day you say, ask Buddha and the Buddhists, please give us Kasati teachings. <laughs> <laughs> so that is quite big, in a way, it's a contradiction. So I always urge Tibetan, we must read these books. And initially, naturally, not easy, difficult. But make effort constantly, years, years, years. Then these difficult texts that become familiar. Then very easy to understand. So we have to make effort. How much we make effort for money? Quite tirelessly. So the <laughs> similar way, make more effort or study, you gain much sort of knowledge. Now, they finally, uh, if because of possible, you see, the Pimutu. Yes, Pimutu please Mata. kneel on your right knee, if mm. possible. If you have bad knees, it's an exception. Tachana, mm. I will sort of mention uh, in Tibetan, then those are the people who uh, know the English, and then you see, read this word. Yeah, huh? Affirm to yourself that you will generate this bodhicitta in front of the Buddha. We have a Buddha statue here in the park, and you should actually imagine the Buddha being actually here with us, surrounded by the great masters of the past, like Master Saraha, Nagarjuna, and the great um, masters of India, as well as the great, uh, like uh, Narupa, Virupa, and uh, the great master Adisha, and as well as the uh, other great uh, masters who are, have. Uh, reached enlightenment and become who were uh, scholar adepts as well uh, surrounding the Buddha before us and so with this uh, you should um, also uh, determined to cultivate bodhicitta and the understanding or uh, the, the understanding or the wisdom of emptiness which are the essence of the teaching of the Buddha and so in order to help all sentient beings you should determine to uh, 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 to, to cultivate bodhicitta and the understanding of emptiness.
So please, with this understanding, repeat these lines for the third time. And oh, no, third time. Oh. With a wish to liberate all my clients, I will always take refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha until I reach the essence of enlightenment. With wisdom, love, and compassion, I will make effort to be benefit beings by abiding before the Buddha to generate the mind of complete enlightenment. For as long as peace and, and as long as sentient beings remain, for that long I will have to dispel the suffering of beings. Thank you. Goodbye now. So, um, on behalf of uh, Tibet House and Tushita, Your Holiness, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for explaining so clearly and profoundly the three principal aspects of the path, namely renunciation, bodhicitta, and emptiness. We request Your Holiness to have stable life and please continue to teach us and guide us in the future till sansara ends. And last but not the least, I would like to mention that these days, Your Holiness, the weather of Delhi is very interesting. From 4 to 8 in the morning, it is winter. From 8 to 12, it is spring. And from uh, 12 to 4, it is summer. And I thank everybody for bearing with us in this heat. And uh, thank you very much. And last but not the least, again, I thank all the sponsors, all the staff of Tushita and Tibet House and the volunteers for helping us to make this function a success. Thank you very much.